Welcome back to part three. Even though this presentation is not geared to those who have a, uh, a full three-dimensional gate lab and you may never have one, it's still very useful to understand what three-dimensional gate analysis is because you'll see this in many scientific papers, reviews of outcomes of surgical interventions, and a lot of the knowledge that we've gained about GATE comes uh, through three-dimensional GATE analysis, which we use in our observational GATE analysis. So what is it? It's a way of taking GATE, which is a complex activity, and separating it into motion at each joint in the sagittal, coronal and the axial plane, which is rotation of the trunk and the limbs, so that you get objective measurement of how the patient's walking that can be used in surgical decision making, can be used to assess surgical outcomes, or change over time to see if your patient is getting better or worse. Uh, so if you have access to this uh, facility, it's it's very useful, uh, but I think for many clinical situations, careful observation can provide you with the knowledge you need to decide on interventions. This used to be a very time-consuming uh, process that actually took several days at the inception of gait analysis back in the seven, 1970s, but now uh, a patient comes to our lab and has a full evaluation in two hours and within 30 to 45 minutes the information is collated and put uh, on the uh, gate lab site in our hospital so that I can access the study down in the clinic while I'm seeing the patient. And that full evaluation includes physical examination, video, foot pressure study, and then the 3D motion study, including moments and powers. If we decide just to do video, that takes only 15 to 20 minutes, but it's done in a nice studio where you can get uh, uh, very high quality videos. And similarly, just the foot pressure study is fairly quick. So here are the components of a full gait lab study. First, the matrix that I showed you earlier, which is done by the physiotherapist before the study is done, uh, documenting uh, all of this physical examination data. Then, uh, markers are placed on the limbs and the trunk in a very specific fashion. They're not necessarily on the centers of motion of the joint, uh, but they are in very specific spots so that when the computer sees them all on, uh, the joint centers can be calculated. And how this occurs is that the patient walks in the middle of the room, uh, which is surrounded by cameras, and most labs have anywhere from six to 12 cameras, and the cameras have a central lens, but are surrounded by infrared light, and the cameras only see infrared light. So in order to identify where a marker is in three-dimensional space, at least two cameras have to be able to see that marker, and the more cameras that see it, the more accurate the identification is going to be. The other thing is that the markers may be obscured by the swinging arms, so that uh, having multiple cameras assures that two cameras uh, will see each marker. And this is what the cameras actually see, just the retroreflective markers, and they use these to compute uh, the joint centers, and you can reconstruct stick figures, and the images are captured at 120 frames a minute, so that uh, 
Uh, these stick figures can then be shown in various phases of gait and smooth, and you can actually get these nice skeletons from the stick figures, which are useful for presentations like this, but we essentially never use for uh, clinical purposes unless we want to show the parents perhaps uh, what the gait looks like. So we get this output uh, of different graphs, which we use to do the gait analysis. And each lab can format their output a little differently, but uh, I think in general, most labs have a similar sort of pattern, whereas the first column here is the sagittal plane, the second column is the coronal plane, front and back, and the third is the transverse plane. And this is a plane that you normally cannot see, uh, that is looking down at the patient from the top or up from the floor, but it gives you rotation, how the trunk is rotating, how the lower extremities and foot are rotating, and is very useful. Uh, the printout has gray bands, which don't really show up well here, which give you the normal adult data, plus or minus one standard deviation. We also get what we call linear data, which is the cadence, steps per minute, the step length, which is the distance between one foot and the second foot as it lands at the beginning of the gait cycle, the stride length, which is the distance covered by one foot throughout the whole gait cycle, basically two steps, and the velocity meters per second. In addition, embedded in the floor are force plates, which calculate kinetics. And these are basically like a standard bathroom scale that have sensors in them. And the, the first sensor is the ground reaction force, the up and down motion. And this basically is pretty much the same as in your bathroom scale. But in addition, try and picture sensors placed sort of sideways so that they, they also record the fore and aft shear as well as the side to side shear. And this is used to calculate kinetics, which can be very useful in certain situations. In addition to the motion data, uh, we get dynamic electromyography, so usually use eight channels of EMG with electrodes that are placed on the skin and rarely fine needles are inserted to get information from the tibialis posterior, but only in special situations. And it's important to note that the signal that you get is not quantitative, it's just qualitative. So the signal will vary depending upon the impedance, uh, how much of a fat layer there is between the electrode and the muscle. It's just basically qualitative, so it tells you when the muscle is working or not working. And this is very useful because in cerebral palsy, what you have is muscles which work excessively. When they should be turning off and quiet, they continue to fire and this impairs uh, the ability of the uh, nice smooth motion so that when the EMG is reported, you see these black bars underneath and they represent normal muscle activity. So if you see activity and you don't see the black bar underneath, that means this is dysphasic activity, extra activity that shouldn't be there and that is impeding motion. We also get foot pressure analysis. Uh, this can be done very simply by just taking photos of the foot. This box is a little confusing, but the patient standing on it, it has a clear top and then the foot under surface, the plantar surface of the foot is reflected on a mirror underneath and then a photo is taken just like this which shows the feet as well as the plantar surface. This however is just static, it's not dynamic. So that the pedobarograph, which is uh, 
uh, proprietary term for one type of these devices, there are several, is dynamic. Uh, it records a full footstep during stance phase so that what you get is this printout of the foot with this line that shows the center of pressure and how it progresses from the heel to the toe. And each one of these areas, such as the heel here, which is green, is recorded on the graph as a green line from the beginning of heel strike at zero seconds until the toe comes off the ground here at 0.9 seconds. So the heel part is green, the forefoot is blue, so you can see how the pressure progresses from the heel to the center part of the foot, forefoot, uh, and this also is very useful. Uh, giving you good information about how much varus or valgus there is. This is an example of how the foot pressure study can help you both with assessment of the deformity and assessment of the outcome of your intervention. Uh, this is a foot pressure study from a 10-year-old boy who was treated by Ponsetti technique as an infant uh, for right club foot and did not require an Achilles tenotomy. I followed him uh, subsequently, and at age 10, he manifested active supination during stance phase of gait, which I observed clinically, and I feel at this point, one should do an intervention uh, to prevent this from progressing to the point where he has a dorsal bunion. So here is his uh, study, and you can see that there's very little metatarsal head pressure, both in the uh, graph as well as in the box representing his first metatarsal head. And furthermore, the fifth metatarsal head didn't begin to take pressure until relatively late during stance phase. So static photos are really insufficient because this dynamic deformity occurs during gait, but not during quiet standing. So here are his foot photos, uh, which really are not uh, terribly helpful, which really are not terribly helpful. So again, here he is before treatment, showing the reduced first metatarsal head pressure. And here he is one year following anterior tibialis transfer to the lateral cuneiform and you can see that the first metatarsal head is now sharing uh, the weight much more so than preoperatively, both in the uh, box representing the first metatarsal head and in the graph. In addition, you can see that the first metatarsal head begins to accept pressure much earlier and more appropriately during stance phase. Also, you can see a marked reduction in the pressure at the base of the fifth metatarsal and a slight reduction in pressure over the fifth metatarsal head, which hopefully will improve with time as the anterior tibialis transfer becomes stronger. So that brings us to the end of this portion of the talk, and um, I hope you stick with it for the next portion as we get more and more uh, into the gate cycle. Thank you.